comfortably zoned with the zigzag man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of life marked pull and fighting the unholy trinity as we go. Big business, organized religion, and government. I am back, comfortably zoned in Alameda, California. I'm Ralph Tycho, and as usual, I seem to be bi-coastal. I have a terrific returning guest who's an author and uh, what I call just a renaissance man. You do it all, Charlie Vascalero. Am I pronouncing that correctly? The C is a little softer. It's just Vascalero, but you're close enough. Oh, man, I just, if I could just keep it in the <laughs> alphabet. Um, yeah. I'm close. But I'll soften the C from here on, and um, that's as good as I get for an introduction. You are terrific. You are, um, you've been on before, and uh, you've got a zest for it. You tend to be where baseball is. You're centered in Baltimore, and uh, you're into a brewery of some sort. Maybe you'll tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, well, in addition to my, my baseball work, which I guess would include writing and speaking and uh, showing people things uh, and, and, and trying to be uh, where I feel like the the uh, most spiritual things are happening in the game at the time. Uh, so that's kind of those are my those are my goals. Um, to to but your help me is right yeah. at the ballpark. Am I correct? Yeah. Well, there's I, there's two different breweries that we're talking about today. <laughs> I happen okay. to tend bar at a brewery. Uh, I tend bar at a place called the Waverly Brewing Company in Baltimore, and uh, it, it is a fantastic new. Uh, uh, craft beer tap room. So uh, we have a lot of fun there, and we watch the Orioles every night. But this weekend, I'm leading a tour of Babe Ruth's Baltimore that begins at another brewery, uh, a place called the Peabody Heights Brewery, and it was the site of the Orioles' original, the old International League Orioles' original ballpark, Oriole Park, which went by a number of names, Terrapin Park. But in the first half of the 20th century, up until 1994, 1944, when the place burned to the ground, it was a hotbed for baseball here in Baltimore. And now there's a brewery sitting on top of it, and we're going to use that as our launching off point and, uh, and conclusion destination on this tour of Babe Ruth's Baltimore. Oh, that's terrific. Now, part of the tour is where Babe Ruth was uh, brought up. The, and ironically, he was brought up in a bar as well, if, uh, if not living <laughs> directly over a bar. Am I correct about that? You are correct. Well, uh, he, he, he was, that was one of his residences. He was actually born a couple of blocks away at his mom's mother's house. But um, bar rooms were central to Ruth's early years in town because that's the business that his father was in. And there was more than one of these uh, bars in Baltimore that were owned by his dad, George Sr., and uh, so that was an early part of uh, being around bars was was part of the Babe's uh, formative years, uh, his growing up years, which also probably led to him being sent to St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys when he was seven years old or eight years old, um, because he was already getting in trouble in the bar <laughs> when he was a kid. Right. So. <laughs> he was what they used to call incorrigible. Yeah, and, and other uh, adjectives as well. <laughs> right. Well, um, you use those because um, uh, my gentle ears can't handle handle it. <laughs> that yes. In another show, you could. <laughs> um, uh, Babe was uh, what made him wh- what he was. Other than the obvious physical skills, what drove him? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I like the word drive. I mean, I, I can could, I could tell you why I think he was a great ball player. I think it, most of it happened between the years, like the best ones. It all happens between the years. He, he had some physical gifts, but uh, just like uh, the, the, any of the greats, there's, uh, you, 
there's a baseball happens in the mind, and the guys who are one step ahead of the other guys are the ones that excel, like the babe and like Ichiro Suzuki, who uh, seems to know what's going on before anybody else does. And I think the babe had that uh, quality. The drive, the drive, I think, came from his his hard scrabble youth, and uh, then becoming inspired as a student at St. Mary's Industrial School for Boy, learning the game and seeing it as an avenue. Uh, as a way out of his situation, like uh, many of the young guys in the Dominican Republic see that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I think the babe had his eye on the prize in that way. And uh, so he was. He had some, some built-in drive. He, a lot of that was fostered at St. Mary's by these um, Zavarian brothers who kind of ran the place. They were stern disciplinarians, but they were also into fun things like baseball and uh, trying to make sure that these kids ended up with a better life than they started with. So that's that's very nice. Um, the uh, the question I have always been uh, curious about is: Did Babe take to the switch in position from being a very very successful left-handed twenty-game winner um, to being a regular? And uh, did he long for the days of pitching? Did he? Um, in in his Yankee years, did uh, he secretly want to get out there in big games? And uh, were, was or were the Yankee management uh, tempted to do so? Um, the way I feel about that is, I, I don't know that I can that I have all of the knowledge to answer what the babe was thinking or feeling. I do think that his um, segue was rather seamless. And uh, I think that everyone involved understood, uh, which I believe there's a famous quote uh, attributed to this, that, uh, you know, there's more jack in it <laughs> in the home runs, right? I, I think that, again, you know, money being part of the bank game, and let's not fool ourselves, it always was. I think that, uh, you know, the idea of Babe Ruth hitting home runs was a draw for the management, and it was uh, also his uh, number one ball in, in contract negotiations and quickly let I play. Well, am I losing you? Um, I I can hear you. Did you not get all of that? That's that no, that's better. You just, we just had a little wave, and you know how the internet works with these phone calls and what uh -huh. have you. So I was scared a little bit there, but I got you loud and clear, my friend. Okay. Um, let's talk about just for a second. Put his statistical prowess when it came to home runs into proportion. He hit more home runs than most teams, Am I, um, just as a starter. Um, he had Gretzky-like stats. And um, what did you learn about him when you got into this project that you didn't know before? Uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, because this tour is focusing on the early years of his life, uh, these are the things I'm, I'm learning more about him, uh, his development uh, as a, a ball player and a person. And uh, I think that he uh, rescued himself, and he was, uh, as much as you look at the babe as this kind of happy-go-lucky guy, I think there was a more serious side to the babe that was uh, focused on his career and his life and uh, making the most of it. And I think that's uh, what I take away, uh, you know, separate and aside from the statistics, which are all a result of, uh, you know, uh, people think of him as an undisciplined guy, which is kind of funny, you know, because of all the carousing and the drinking. But you know what kind of discipline it takes to put up all that bold face type <laughs> to, to be that much, much better than everybody a, else? How much of that was exaggerated? I think that he was, he lived large, and I don't know that the, the carousing is necessarily exaggerated. I just think that the serious focus is underplayed. That the, the, you know that, that was all done. Most of that was done before and after work. You know, then there was work. So right. Um, defensively, did he measure up in the um, in his prime years? Yeah, he was a fantastic athlete. You know, people look at the, the beer belly, but the guy was a fantastic athlete, and uh, he ran around very well. He, he covered right field very well. He had a he had a fairly strong arm for the time. Um, he was fleet of foot on the bases. 
he stole home 10 times. He hit 130 something triples. Um, you know, so, uh, I think he, he was, um, not quite a, what we would call a five tool player, but he was a very well rounded, very versatile player. And you talked about pitching before and whether or not he had the desire to return. Every now and then he did return, like towards the end of his career, and he won those games too. <laughs> well, okay. Um, how did he get along with ma- with his manager? Not management per se, but with his yeah. manager. Uh, the field guys. No, uh, well, he gave, you know, uh, Miller Huggins ulcers, of course. <laughs> but, uh, okay. you know, I, I think every manager knows that feeling. Uh, you know, when you're the manager, you're trying to be in control of everything. And uh, there's certain things that are not within your control, and sometimes it involves your star players. <laughs> and uh, add to the pressures you get to read about how you did in tomorrow's paper every every day. Um, so it's a tough job being a manager. It ages you very quickly. Um, in any era, you see that managers come in, and um, it's like being president of the United States uh, on some level. Let me do a little segue. You also, sure. You do, th- you do something with em- the late Emmett Ashford, who was um, the first major league umpire of uh, Africa, African-American descent. And, yes. And um, you, restore, um, you restored his grave site. Um, is he buried up in Cooperstown? Yes. Uh, this was something I only learned this uh, summer. Uh, I spent two months in Cooperstown. I love going to Cooperstown. I use it as a retreat. I get some writing done. I go up there to clear my mind, uh, breathe the clean air, and get up early and go to bed early and live by the lake. So uh, I enjoy the time I spend there. Uh, this year, I was up there, and one of the things I like to do in town is uh, visit a cemetery, which is very close to the Hall of Fame. A couple of years ago, I uh, spontaneously attended the funeral of a man I did not know uh, eight years ago in Cooperstown, a guy named Harry Skillman. And I was invited to this funeral by uh, one of the guys uh, who worked in the library at the Hall of Fame, Tim Wiles, a research uh, librarian in Cooperstown who used to also double as Casey at the bat. He would perform as Casey and recite the poem and show up dressed in Casey's uniform periodically at places. And one day he was on his way. <laughs> he was on his way to a funeral. Yes, Casey was. Oh yeah. So, the, so I think Mud Hill Nine. The, the Mudville Nine, definitely. And uh, one day, Tim was walking out of the library dressed like this, and, and invited me to this funeral he was uh, participating in. And uh, it was more fun than funerals usually are. A bunch of guys gathered around, and some take me out to the ball game and put this guy in the grave. And um, it was a, a, a nice little celebration. And uh, every year since then, I go back to this guy's grave and have a beer and smoke a cigar on his grave and hang out with him for a little while. There's a, he requested on his headstone that people come by and talk to him, so I do. And uh, this year, while I was doing that, I took a photograph of myself doing that that I shared on the Facebook, and Tim Wiles saw it, and he reminded me that Emmett Ashford was buried nearby, uh, old, the first African-American umpire in Major League Baseball. I had no idea about this, and I, I just turned to my left and walked about 75 paces, and there was Ashford's grave. And, um, I, you know, uh, go ahead, let's, you ask me something now. <laughs> Take it upon yourself. You obviously have an interest in African Americans who uh, cross the line. I want to recommend a book to you that I've had in my library for years and that I go to almost on a daily basis. It is indeed named Crossing the Line, and it chronicles the black major leaguers from 1947 to 1959 and um, doesn't include umpires and that's the the first book I thought of uh, about it's tremendously well done and um, just uh, anybody out there I'm sure it's on eBay or um, 
Oh, I'm quite familiar with it, Ralph. I have it, and I reference that book frequently uh, because it, it serves as a fantastic oral history of the integration experience. Uh, you know, you've got it covered. I think they got it covered from pretty much the first African American player to play for every major league team. I think that they, they were able to obtain interviews and, and gather those oral histories from all of them. I'm almost all of them. If they didn't get all of them. Right, and it is um, absolutely priceless in terms of its reliability. There, I mean, most books you read, you can say, well, you know, that's a mistake. You know, you look at any but a real baseball historian um, can say, well, you know, that date is off or they're wrong on that. Or nothing in this book needs needs changing. Absolutely nothing, and. Um, it, I've gone to it for years, and i um, glad you appreciate it. I thought we'd get that in there as long as we're talking um, Afri- African-Americans who paid a price. You can imagine the, the price that Emmert Ashford play, paid, just as all umpires. You're always going to boo, boo umpires on occasion. Well, here's an excuse, because um, you got to remember how baseball is. It wasn't all 1947 with Jackie. In 1959, the Boston Red Sox called up Elijah Pumpsy Green, and he was the first Red Sox to play in in the majors 12 years after Jackie. I mean, uh, it's craziness. Um, by the end of the 50s, all-star teams were made up of – I mean, you're talking Aaron, Mays, Clemente, um, Frank Robinson, um, and the Red Sox didn't didn't see fit to call up a black black person until 19, um, 1959. So and, slow, and slowly, I imagine. Tell me what Ashford himself had to go through in his minor league days in. in um, going through what uh, guys like Frank Robinson and Vita Pinson went through. Tell yes, me. well, uh, let's just stay right on the timeline that you've just uh, drawn out there for us. You know, you were going along chronologically. You said it took baseball until it took the Red Sox until 1959 to sign Pumpsy Green. Well, it took baseball until 1966. To move Ashford up to the big leagues, and uh, I think this is uh, you know, there's a lot in that number. 1947 to 1966 is just about a generation, I would say, you know, 20 years. And so it took baseball 20 years after having its first African American player to allow to have an African American in a position of authority, which was tremendous um, at the time, and uh, obviously. I think Ashford's story is a little undertold here. I would imagine he met with similar adversity. Uh, this is a guy now who's going to be calling third strikes on, on uh, you know, white players from the Deep South who are playing in the major leagues. Maybe have some uh, uh, different kinds of opinions about this whole thing. I mean, uh, he handled it from what I see in the research I've done, uh, you know, with aplomb because he was a very good-natured and uh, – fun-loving, entertaining guy. A guy worked in the entertainment industry. Uh, later, he became a television and movie star. He was in the Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars, played an umpire, of course. He was an accomplished dancer, and he was a really snappy dresser. So these are the things that Ashford used to combat what was coming at him. He used his own charisma. He, he battled it with his own charisma. And uh, I think that's a little bit of an undertold story. Uh, at the graveside, I did get his grave all cleaned and restored, but I also placed a time capsule, which contains photographs and cards and uh, one baseball, but it, it has a lot of things that you were speaking of. We got Jackie Robinson in there, the first African-American player. I got Frank Robinson, the first African-American manager. I got Bill Lucas, the first African-American GM, and I got Bill White, the first African-American league president, all in this box with a real white baseball in there as well, and then one big picture of Emmett Ashford in the middle to uh, put his story in its historical context. Wow. That, um, that's very cool. That, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> you, live, you live every ba- 
baseball Michiganer's life. <laughs> I say that I, I say that with deep respect because uh, Thank you. A, a fellow that I did um, that I do a weekly show on, on my network, um, Peter Golenbach, um dubbed the three of us, Al, Alan Blumpkin, my co-host on that show, one of the co-hosts on Peter's show, he dubbed yeah. the three of us the three be, three baseball Meshuganas, and um, I think that's a big compliment to be called a, a baseball Meshugana. Now we, um, you're the first Italian to be called a baseball Meshugana. <laughs> yeah, or you know what though? That. It's probably not the first time. Actually, I think uh, we're kindred spirits, and uh, uh, that that happens among kindred spirits. It, religion has nothing to do with it, does it? Yeah, exactly. Religion. We we are we've created our own religion here, and we're all of a shared ethnicity when you think about it. So. <laughs> and even Ralph Bra- and even Ralph Branca qualifies as that. He he can be Italian and Jewish at the same time. Um, the way it turns out. Yeah. But that's another. That's another story. Um, and thank God, in a way, for Ralph Branca from my baseball standpoint, because. Um, I was an early New York Giant fan, and um, you talked about your pilgrimage. I recently made a pilgrimage to where once sat the old lady, the Polo Grounds itself. There is a newly restored, when I say newly in the past decade, um, staircase. Uh, It's called the Brush staircase and it leads down to where the polo grounds once were and it was the staircase that would um, take people coming off the D train um, at 155th Street down to the polo grounds and they restored it and there's a plaque down um, where home plate stood and uh, we went back there I did a podcast back there a few weeks ago it's where I grew up. I live in California, but I, my heart's in New York in a lot of ways. And um, uh, went back there, had a pilgrimage, if you will, and uh, it was real cool. So we're both we're both a little nuts. Meshuggah, for those of you who don't know the Yiddish expression, means uh, it means fadrek. I'll give you another Yiddish expression to really confuse you. But um, it's a nice way of saying we're a little off the wall with baseball. But what a love affair! What uh, we've um, takes you through the times in your life when things were good and when things were bad. Yeah, that was a very nostalgic and romantic recollection of your time uh, in the at the old polo grounds. And uh, one of the elements I like about that story is the idea of arriving at the ballpark by train, which is another. Uh, one of the simple joys of the game is uh, riding on the train. And when I go to City Field and I used to go to Shea Stadium, I, I loved getting off the number seven line and, and coming down those stairs. Uh, you know, everybody's heart starts racing a little bit more. You just can really start smelling the hot dogs and the knishes and everything else that they're selling out on the street. And, uh, you, you know, uh, whether or not you have a ticket, you enter into the kind of scalping zone there, and uh, everything is just heightened. Uh, uh, when you come off those well, stairs. Right now, a kid, there was, when I was a kid, there were three major league teams in New York City itself. I mean, we had the the New York Yankees, we had the Brooklyn Dodgers, we had the New York Giants, and now you have to, when you say New York Giants, you have to say the New York Baseball Giants. It used to be the yeah. other way around. You'd say the New York Football Giants, and. Um, all of a sudden, 1957, I'm 10, 11 years old, and boom, they're gone. And that was that's a traumatic time in a kid's life. And uh, I just want to put the word out there, because what you do is um, partially with your the book directed at children, you're bringing young fans into the game. But with that, baseball has a responsibility not to move a franchise indiscriminately if it 
can be at all avoided given the fact that you're making a, a pact with young kids at five, six, and seven to be uh, to be fans, fanatics is what a yeah. fan is, basically. And all of a sudden you take that away from a kid, that sucks. <laughs> so if there's well, anybody listening yeah. out there who has a hand in that in any way, Robert Moses and people like Walter O'Malley, Robert Moses, or, or people wish they rot in hell. You don't want to be remembered that way from taking a kid, removing a franchise from kids. And um, I, I'll, I'll up you one on that one, Ralph, because that is the business of baseball rearing its ugly head. And in the uh, case of O'Malley. You know, you have the, the Dodgers uh, departing, and these are all for business reasons. I mean, that's all it was, and it was it, they were playing poker with the teams. They were putting up their chips and seeing uh, whether or not they'd win their bet or hedge their bet, and so then they move. Well, they had, a, they had to have willing, you know, um, partners, com- complicity uh, on the other end of the move, too, and in Los Angeles, that came in the form of dislocating <laughs> a whole bunch of people who lived in Chavez Ravine, so that's that that move's got uh, puts a bad taste in my mouth on both ends of it. <laughs> well, um, that's a very very good point. But let me just um, put an explanation mark on what kind of a person O'Malley was. He was making good money in Brooklyn. As a matter of fact, he had the most profitable franchise in the National League. He did it for pure, unadulterated greed, power yeah. and greed. It, um, now, Stoneham, on the other hand, more, um, was gone. He was going to Minneapolis. He wasn't making it. Him, you could understand a little bit. Yeah, a little bit more. And he had a, he had a more legitimate connection to the region as well. Um, he, he spent half the year out there in California for years before. Uh, he was always kind of an owner with one foot on each, and he, he, just like us. He was bi-coastal, uh, just like we are today. Right. Scared me there for a second. I had no idea. <laughs> yes, we are bi-coastal, by golly. <laughs> Who knows? I'm not running for anything. No public public restrooms for me. It doesn't matter. I didn't. I didn't necessarily... Uh, mean for that pregnant pause, that might just be internet delay. Even worse. <laughs> it might be. You never know what it is. Let's keep them guessing, Charlie. Let's keep them guessing. Hey, you're terrific. I really enjoy having you. Um, you'll come back again soon, I trust. Yes, yes. I'll uh, look forward to it. There's always more to discuss. Like the we use have a lot of the, to discuss. Is there anything I'm forgetting that you want to talk about? Anything you want I, to really plug? Um, this is uh, selfless self promotion. Uh, comfortably zoned is so. Go for um, it. What do you need? Well, I'll, I'll definitely plug it. our kid's book again. Okay, which is uh, you brought it up Wonderful. at the ballpark. Uh, a fan's companion. Um, so it's at the ballpark, a fan's companion. It's a book kids take to the game with them that gets them through the process of being at the game, tells them everything they need to know, asks them to make observations and answer questions, comes with a pencil. There's a website for the book. It's simply a fanscompanion.com. So I'll mention that. And then, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, during the waning days of the pennant race, and we're having a frustrating time here in Baltimore. The, the sun seems to be setting on us. I'm not sure if we're going to make it into that wild card spot. I'm also a Mets fan, as you know, which are we're hanging right on the fringe there as well. But, uh, you know, they, they show these inspirational movie clips sometimes when you're at the game. And uh, they put up uh, clips from sports movies, Rocky, and different things to try and get the fans to make some noise in the ninth inning and get the team to rally. I, I have a new favorite that I don't think anybody is using, and I, I wish they would. It's Walter Matthau's tirade in the Bad News Bears when he <laughs> goes ballistic on the kids. It would never that, actually um, play. <laughs> he, was, he was priceless. And as a matter of fact, I've had as a guest, a fellow by the name of David Pollock, who played one, uh, was one of the child actors. Yeah, yeah. He now lives in Southern California. He's 
uh, running for some sort of office. I think that's assured that he won. He's a I think he might have been Rudy. Was he Rudy? Yes, he was, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, one of the best characters in the movie, Rudy yeah, Stein. And uh, he, he played that very well. Um, and he's uh, one of those politicians that you don't spit up bile when you think of his name because he's an environmentalist. And uh, he's one of those people that I, I could recommend if I lived in Southern California, he'd have my vote for whatever he's he's running for. And Walter Matthau has the original Odd Couple. Um, he was so tremendous. He plays so big a part in what I consider to be dry humor, um, understated, the regular guy being funny, not... Uh, yeah, well, that one scene where he has his tirade, tirade, it's also the moment of enlightenment in the film. And, you know, even though I'm kind of half-joking about putting that up as a rally clip, I think that there's a fantastic, genuine sentiment contained in the whole thing and the whole movie. But in that scene where he's berating every player on the team for what he doesn't think is putting in their best effort in the championship game, he's just getting frustrated, he, he sees this look in their faces that realizes he's gone over the edge with his <laughs> his fit. Right. And he comes to the realization in that moment that uh, he, he's, he's overdone it. And he stops himself and in the middle of his tirade, and he just tells all the kids, uh, go out there and do the best you can, <laughs> which is actually a great message for any fans that want their team to rally. <laughs> That's the most supportive thing you can say. <laughs> a great message for every human being. You do the best you can, and you live with the results. That's right. That's all you can do. Uh, it's pretty simple, but um, it's worth listening to. Well, thank David Hirsch for that one. You got um, it. All right, my friend. Thank you. Come back soon. I'm going to end the episode the way I generally do. I'm going to implore you and the audience um, to keep your dreams wet, keep your humor dry, keep your children out of the offices of military recruiters and your grandkids too. And also keep your kids and grandkids off the laps of clerics that wear dresses just to be on the safe side. I know it can't be but one in 10 million guys out there that go bad. But, you know, they make a big impression. So um, <laughs> if, um, if that works for you, it works for me, and we'll catch you next time around the track. See you later, everybody. <laughs>